this is a great example of what a lot of us call hybrid intelligence, where we're complementing human abilities with machine capabilities. So while the AI is not directly like teaching us how to be more creative, it's created this kind of environment and set of dynamic, you know, and ever-changing situations that stimulate this part of our brain development. And so as a result, AI is helping us become more creative. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today, our guest is Neil Sahota. Neil is an IBM Master Inventor, United Nations AI Advisor, Chief Innovation Officer, and globally recognized speaker and author of the award-winning Best Business Book of 2019, Own the AI Revolution. Neil is a founding member of the UN's AI for Good initiative and is actively helping them build out their ecosystem of strategic partnerships. Additionally, through his work with the global Fortune 500 companies as a change maker, he created a disruptive thinking framework to show people how you can think differently. Welcome to the show, Neil. Hey, thanks for having me on, Justin. Well, I gave a little bit of, of a brief description with regards to where you are today. Just kind of curious to know kind of how, how you got into technology and, and maybe the trajectory of your career from when you started to where you are now. I'd say it's probably a series of happy accidents that got me here. So truth be told, my first foray into technology, I was like an eight-year-old kid. And love playing sports. I remember my mom saying that you can't just play sports. You have to do something different. I think she had her heart set on me learning a musical instrument. And I didn't really want to do that. And I remember she was bringing it up again while we were at some shopping center. And I was walking by. There was a place where they were teaching you computer programming. And so my mom was like, you have to pick something. So I said, I want to learn computers. And she's like, looked at me, looked at me. She's like, okay, took me in and signed me up. And so... I'm in a class with like, you know, people in the early 20s <laughs> learning basic programming. <laughs> sure, sure. And like the old Apple II, stuff like that. That's that it, the, exactly. The Hello world. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Print statements and go-to statements. Yeah, all that early stuff. That was fun. I actually really enjoyed it. That I wasn't expecting. That's kind of how I got my foray into computer science. And, you know, I kept pursuing that. The honest truth is that I never sat around thinking that I'm going to pioneer AI or do any of these other things. I just kept looking for opportunities. And about 17, eight years ago, when business intelligence really started picking up and I was working with some, you know, very large companies and had people saying, like, it's amazing what computers are telling us. I thought to myself, like, well, they're not really telling us anything, right? We have nice tools to collect lots of data and store it and slice and dice it, make nice looking reports. But I started to myself, could a computer look at data and actually analyze it like a person could? And that set me down this path of developing something I was calling enterprise intelligence, which we now call machine learning. And so I had some patents and other things that got the attention of IBM R&D. Got a call and they said, hey, we want to talk to you about some of your work because we're working on a secret project just got started. I think you solved some problems for us. And the next thing I know, they're asking me to join the secret project called Watson back then. Oh, wow. Okay. So you were early in on that Watson uh, stuff, huh? Early in, part of the original team and trying to figure out, can the computer play Jeopardy? <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. That was like Deep Blue, right? Was that, was that one of the early ones too? Deep Blue was uh, 1997. That was the computer that could play chess, but that was brute force calculation, right? That's not not quite the same as AI. It was calculating every possible move and scenario and making the statistically best choice. Sure. Jeopardy was a different challenge because think about the natural language, Justin, that we use. We're talking about a game show where there's some slang and jargon and everything is phrased in the form of an answer. You have to figure out the question. We didn't know if we could actually do this. And the, when we reached out to the Jeopardy folks, they had to have a two-year commitment in advance because they actually tape things out that far out and 
the media set up and all these things. And so I still remember like Sam Palm was out. I'll go like, are you sure you guys can do this? And of course we're like, yeah, sure. We had no idea we could or not. <laughs> we're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the world of technology. You just say yes all the time, you know, you'll figure it out. Yeah, and, and the truth is it's no secret now that it was 50, 50, the night of the challenge that Watson would work. And if you watch like the old clips on YouTube, you might see some of us there. Watson didn't actually start out well. It missed like six of its first seven questions. And you can see us back then on our Blackberries going like, hey, I might be looking for a new job. Yeah. <laughs> but sure. su surprisingly, it turned, turned it around and won. So everyone's like, this is amazing. This is a game changer. You know, what are you guys going to do next? You know, as we hadn't thought that far out. We never thought past Jeopardy. And it's like, well, you guys spent a lot of money and a lot of time. What are you doing with this? And so we said, we'll get back to you. And we had a bit of an internal holy war about the next step. Because historically, IBM lost smart people. History of trying to do things that are kind of our own and build up these solutions and products. And I was one of the people advocating, like, this is just too big of a game changer that let's open up the platform for other people to use. It could be applied anywhere. Let's give people that. Not just here's some software tools and APIs, and here's some training around that. Let's help people actually ideate and create, you know, their own products, their own services, essentially a new venture, whether it's entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial, right? Because it's, it's a different model of computing, and that ultimately won out. That's awesome. So that was the early days of basically creating an AI platform, right? And and IBM, I mean, were you guys kind of the first first to market? I think for something like that, yes. I think it really showed the potential of what could be. I mean, back back then, you know, this was 2011. Probably the the only real things we would call AI at that point were Watson and Palantir. Palantir was locked away because of all their military contracts at the time. And I think it got a lot of people kind of, one, frightened, unfortunately. We were getting death threats and things like that. But it got a lot of people kind of thinking about what's actually possible. Because yeah. it's not just, okay, the natural language and the machine learning on being able to answer the questions. It was teaching watching the strategy of the game, right? There was actually a lot of these other things that had come together to be a great player. I think people started realizing we could probably use this to solve some of the, the bigger challenges that we have. And so when we created the ecosystem, one of the first places we actually went into was healthcare because lots of pain points, lots of data. So could we do something? I was advocating, let's start off small. Let's build some maybe simple diagnostic tools for doctors and nurses. The marketing guys went out saying like, we're going to cure cancer. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Go whoa. Cancer is really complex. There's different forms, different stages, all these things. You, know, you have to collect all this data. It's not like we're going to come up with a cure for cancer in a couple of years. But I think that's where, unfortunately, where the hype and the newness really kind of kicked in and people's expectations surround AI capabilities just skyrocketed. Sure. And, and I, I mean, I think we, maybe we've gone through another, maybe two, I don't know, AI winters, I guess, between... What happened then and now? It seems like every 10 years, everyone has these huge expectations that it's going to completely change the world and it's kind of drifted back. But it, it feels like it's maybe here to stay now with some of the new deep learning techniques. I don't know what your view is of that. I absolutely agree, Justin. I think that now people have kind of reset their expectations a couple of times. But I think there's much better understanding and awareness of what AI can do and what it can't do. And the challenge is just with, do we have good data and is that data actually available for training? I think it's put a tamper on, I'll call it the pie in the sky ideas, but I think people are still very impressed and to some degree sometimes surprised, but we can actually teach an AI system to do. Because a lot of people, especially in the early days, thought about automation as that's what we used to do, faster, cheaper, or less errors. But we're talking about the third generation of computers now. There's, there's a whole new so the capabilities here and the fact that you have a machine that can actually take on activities that require some level of cognition opens up new, new areas because now you look at what we're doing today, well, we're using AI to help depress the suicidal teenagers. There's this whole field of artificial empathy and communication coaches. 
So some of the things that we thought that machines would never really be good at, surprisingly, they are because we found a way to commoditize that training and actually teach them how to assist us humans in doing some of these activities, even the soft skill ones. That's fascinating. Yeah, totally. This kind of the bias, like, oh, yeah, a computer will never be able to do that. Now, probably debate around if it actually feels anything, but it can certainly act like it does, right? And at the end of the day, as long as it's improving humans' lives, that's really all, all that matters in a lot of these cases. 100%, Justin. I think it's surprising, and I think some people think it's good or there's value, but I also know there's some people that they're not afraid is not the right word. Either. I think they feel like their place in the universe has become a little bit more muted. That some of the things that we thought made us special that only humans could do, some of that's been kind of taken away. It kind of diminished our place in the universe, if you will. And so maybe yeah. it's a little bit blow to the ego. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. What was the next thing that you moved on to? Because I know, you know you've been a part of the United Nations AI advisor. Um, Chief Innovation Officer at UC Irvine, kind of where, where did you move next, I guess, after leaving IBM? So helping to build out that ecosystem got me the uh, attention of the United Nations. And I was invited to come give a, a big speech, an event they do every four years with all the world leaders and ambassadors. And I was warned in advance that they thought AI is Terminator time. It's going to rise up, <laughs> conquer the world, eradicate humanity. So no pressure. <laughs> so I, I went in and I had a 30-minute speech. And I, I was a little bit more optimistic than the Terminator scenario. But I didn't just talk about what is AI and how do we regulate it. I actually focused some half my speech talking about how we're already using AI for public service. And I spent some time talking about how we could use AI to help fulfill the goals of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And the speech was very well received. I, I got a nice standing ovation. So I was really appreciative. But that evening at the reception, the Secretary General sought me out. And he was like, Neil, we never thought about using the technology. Right? We're worried about regulating and misuse. But there's an opportunity here. And there's a lot of momentum. A lot of people are excited about you, what you're talking about. And I want to do something. Help, can you help me figure something out? I'm like, well, of course. <laughs> and so I went up meeting with him and his team the next week. And we were kind of talking about what we could do. And this was essentially the, the birth of the AI for Good initiative. So solution-based projects, not just policy papers or talking points, but we actually build real things that help real people. And to do that, they needed help with, okay, how do we structure everything? How do we assess project ideas? How do we, you know, manage a portfolio? So that in one of my, you know, to-dos as the AI advisor for the UN. But the other piece was actually the partnership piece. Because historically, you know, the UN's a collection of different agencies that never actually work together. They all have their own little domains. And so one of my big things was to break that culture. Because right, there was no way they're really going to understand and adopt AI, let alone champion the use of it otherwise. And so I actually helped them build their own ecosystem around AI for Good, where the agencies worked together and they worked with other nonprofits, NGOs, private industry, and academia. So this was a whole new world for them to do this, but it was this conglomerate of people coming together to essentially, you know, volunteer their time, volunteer their resources that really spurred action into the whole AI for Good initiative, which is why today we've completed probably about close to 300 projects. We have 117 active projects going on right now. Jeez, that's phenomenal. And, and you know, lo looking at some of the other things, it seems like you're personally invested being on board of directors for several nonprofit organizations. And it seems like you like to give back, I guess, a lot in, in a lot of different ways. I, I commend you for that. That's really cool. I, I appreciate that, Justin. I, I really have to give a lot of credit to my sense of community service to my parents and growing up because I'm actually originally from New York and it was a bit of a rough neighborhood, but it was a very tight knit community. So you were always trying to see how you just help each other out. And that became really part of my DNA. So I'm, I'm a big believer in we could all do something to help people and planet. We just sometimes don't look for those opportunities in the normal stuff we do day to day. 
Yeah, well, it's good to have people like you in the world. Thank you for giving back and doing some really, really cool stuff here. So the the UN, that's got to be an awesome experience. I mean, you, I'm sure you your network was very connected with people from all over the world. And then when did you start thinking about wanting to write a book? I mean, that's just another, it feels to me like a pretty, a pretty big uh, milestone, I think, to be able to achieve that. It was, and writing a book was an interesting experience. I, I actually had talked about doing it for two years before I actually started doing it. I just never had the time. And it was one of the reasons I, I finally decided I, I'm going to leave IBM. So I wanted to make the time to help people because IBM work, the UN works, all these other things. What I found is a lot of people had the same questions. And in particular, there were two questions everyone had, which was, I know I need to be doing something with AI. How do I figure that out? And then second, if I figure that out, how do I actually get started? Because a lot of, a lot of people thought, again, it's like the previous computing. I got a lot of smart programmers and data scientists and stuff. They'll let me know what I can do. But with AI, it's because it's, it's different capabilities and the way it gets used and it's trained is different. Most technologists don't know the domain they're working in or the industry they're working in well enough to know where the pain points actually are. And so because the, some of the best solutions I've seen actually come from, you know, the business or domain side of the world. I wanted to find a way to help people get that basic understanding without all the technical jargon, without the fear mongering, and be able to see, you know, through some of the, the, the stories, the case studies of my book about just you know, regular non-technical people creating these amazing AI solutions. So the goal of the book was to, to give them that and answer those two questions. How do I figure out what I should be doing and how do I get started? Yeah, cool. And it's called Own the AI Revolution. We'll have liner notes here when we publish the podcast here. And I'll make sure to include links off to the book and links off to the United Nations AI Advisor, all that sort of stuff. I love the approach of sort of starting with the problem set. You find, at least personally, I find a lot of people walking around with AI as the technology. It's like the hammer looking for the nail, right? And and it's like, yeah, we can do all this amazing stuff, but like ultimately what business problem are you trying to solve? So kind of flipping it around <laughs> and taking a look at what is AI? And I guess the title is interesting, you know, own the AI revolution. Where where, where did that idea come from, I guess? You, you know, you're you looking to have somebody actually step up and take ownership? Yeah, and I feel like each one of us actually has the ability to do something. Let's think, think of a meaningful idea. You know, the, the title has got a bit of a story behind it, Justin. So if you don't mind indulging me for a second, that was not the original title of the book. I actually wanted to call it Uber Yourself Before You Get Kodak. So one okay. of my good buddies is Peter Diamandis, who used that phrase a couple of times. And he was like, Neil, you can go ahead and use that for your book. Don't worry about it. But my publisher hated it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They absolutely hated the title. They wanted to call the book AI or Die. And I was kind oh, okay. of against the, you know, hopeful message I'm trying to get to people. But my publisher was nice enough to, to try and work on this. And so we kind of went back and forth discussing what made the sense. And, you know, it basically came out that, look, through the Watson work, we kind of, we kind of started the wave of this AI and we're going through now this fourth industrial revolution, basically this gigantic digital transformation that's being powered by AI. And a lot of people kind of feel helpless or hopeless about it, that, oh, the AI is going to take my job, or, you know, I'm going to be reliant on the big tech companies to you know, create these tools and push things out. And so we realized that own the AI revolution made a lot of sense because each one of us can actually be a driver in this revolution. You don't have to be the passenger here's how you do that. So that's how it kind of came, came together for the title. I love it. That's great. Good for you to just sort of push back on the publisher too, you know, as well, <laughs> and not have them completely drive the decisions. Because yeah, thinking about them, they, they probably don't know the space as well as you do, right? Most, most, most publishers might, might be publishing a bunch of different stuff, but you as the author, they should probably have ultimate say with regards to what it's going to go out as. And, you know, I was thinking about like just disruption in general when you mentioned Peter Diamandis. I mean, he's well known for sort of being this disruptive innovator in the space for many, many years. And, you know, you've, you've created this framework. I think you and I were talking about before we started the podcast here. And I'd like you to talk a little bit maybe about sort of how it works. I mentioned it during the intro, sort of a thinking framework of how people can think differently. And it feels like 
you know, you've sort of done this over your career. How, how, how does this work? Like, and is this woven into the book, I guess, as well? I guess I've done some amazing things in my career, maybe more than I realized since I was on the inside. But people are like, how do you think of these things, right? Because I always say, like, there's an innovator in all of us. It's not the domain of just Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. You know, it was always like, well, it starts by thinking differently. And everyone rolls their eyes like, great, Neil. That's what everybody says. Think differently. Think outside the box. How do you do that? And so I finally, a couple of years ago, said, how did I do that? And I look back at my career and stuff, and I realized I actually did some steps. I learned some techniques that I actually apply to do this. And so I put this together in something I call Tuckbo. And Tuckbo, the, the letters stand for the different kind of stages. The first stage is T, think different. And this is really then how do you really ideate? And so you, you know, challenge assumptions, different perspectives. There's different techniques I've learned. So you can actually come up with this kind of innovative idea. But once you have the idea, you have to go to you, which is understand different. So how do I know this idea is actually valuable? How do I actually know that it's you know, solving for a, a need? And so this becomes kind of an alignment thing to, and refine the idea to see, is there value and meaning here? And if there is, then you go to C, which is create different. So it's how do you actually implement this? How do you get the right people, the right skills, and actually build it? roll it out, you know, through deployment. And then you go to B, which is be different. So it's not enough to have a, a great product or even a great idea. How do you drive adoption? How do you help people understand the value they're going to realize from this? And then in tangent with that is the O, which is own different. So actually building the infrastructure around this to support it so your you know innovation actually can be successful. And it's the O where I find a lot of people or a lot of organizations really stumble around with. T, of course, as well. But the O, like I was like to use Tesla as an example in that they weren't the first EV electric vehicle company out there. And it's not like they revolutionized battery technology. And I know they have some sleek design, but that wasn't really enough to suddenly spur the, the, the whole growth they, they achieved. They actually tackled the biggest issue I think most people had was I'm worried about running out of power. And so they actually went out and built the infrastructure of supercharging stations. They built an app so you could find the stations, negotiated with the business parks, the retailers, and so forth to, to build these stations in all these places. They provided that infrastructure that facilitated the, the adoption and facilitated their success. And so, yeah, it's, it's sort of following this framework that you've been successful at that you're letting people know about. Have you, and again, we'll put links off to your, off to the neilsahoda.com website. Like where do people learn to find out more about this sort of step-by-step -step program? So uh, interestingly enough, there's a little bit of it in my, my book on the AI revolution. I'm actually 90% done with my second book, which is actually just about Tuckbo and how you actually put this out. And so I'm starting to put more information about Tuckbo and some of these steps onto my website. And I'm sharing some stories through my social media. But you look at things like, you know, as humans, we don't think about audio data as much other unless we're listening to a podcast or something like that. But thanks to Tuckbo, we have organizations like Rainforest Connection that are now have figured out we can use audio data to identify people that are doing illegal forestization or illegal yeah. animal poaching. Yeah, have you have you worked with those guys before? Topher White was was a guy I've, I actually met at that organization years ago. Yeah, I, er, early on and helped help facilitate you know some of the UN stuff, but their work is just amazing, right? It's not something we intuitively really think about. Where people are kept thinking about: can we use satellite imagery? Can we use video feeds? The, the whole audio thing was just a stroke of brilliance. That that was a great example of you know challenging some key assumptions, but you know through my Tuckbo framework. So love what those guys are doing. Very cool. When you said you spoke originally about AI and people are all sort of worried about it coming to take my job and, and all that type of stuff. I mean, you just got to look around you and just see all the benefits, especially around like voice assistants now, you know, that are just everywhere. While the AI term can scare people, it's kind of already here. And if you just start pointing out situations, self-driving cars, you know, self-flying self airplanes in a lot of ways, right? I just flew back from a business trip and 
you know, I, I know that uh, the pilots there, they just kind of set autopilot <laughs> pretty much most of the time. And, <laughs> you know, the airplane can fly itself much better than they ever could. So it, it's really all around us and it's doing some really, really good things. Are there, are there any applications that, are, that you're kind of blown away by, I guess, that you've seen over, over the past couple of years that, that you really like to use as, as references? There's two that I'm really passionate about and I've seen a lot of advancements towards. So first is really around the whole area of artificial empathy. Even though the machines don't feel the emotions, they're good at detecting and responding. And it's, this has become more than just even the body language, but this whole now use of neurolinguistics. And that you know, language is like a fingerprint. And based on the, just the word choice you're, you're, you, know, you normally use, we can decode a lot about, okay, what's your commitment level? How, how do you actually best learn? What were your values? And if I want to communicate with you or engage you, what are the right words and the right things to even focus on? It's, it's, you know, it's become an amazing tool. And this just started from work with depressed and suicidal teenagers. So giving people some of these safe outlets, not a replacement for human relationships, but these safe outlets where they can build their confidence up and try and then connect meaningfully with, with people. So artificial empathy, one big area. The second, this is surprising even to myself, is actually augmenting human creativity. We have not figured out a way to teach AI to be imaginative or creative yet, but what we found out is we can actually complement our own abilities through the use of AI, the metaverse, and cognitive science. So this whole notion about complex problem solving using digital twins, it's been great scenario planning, more risk, because, hey, it's like you're in the Doctor Strange Bear universe, whatever I do here doesn't impact the real world. But we found over time is that the people that were doing this actually sustained some growth in some of these areas, particularly creative thinking. They were able to actually now achieve that kind of state of flow much faster and actually maintain it much longer. And this is a great example of what a lot of us call hybrid intelligence, where we're complementing human abilities with machine capabilities. So while the AI is not directly like teaching us how to be more creative. It's created this kind of environment and set of dynamic, you know, and ever changing situations that stimulate this part of our brain development. And so as a result, AI is helping us become more creative. That's fascinating. One of the beauties that I think about, and the reason I started this podcast frankly, is just AI can be applied in so many different areas. I, I feel like I'm never going to run out of guests to talk to <laughs> on this because just the moment I feel like, oh, I'm kind of running at the end of this stuff and somebody comes up with some new you know, solution in terms of how, how they're using artificial intelligence, it's just a really, really awesome ongoing piece of technology, I think, that's just going to continue to morph for, for decades to come. Sky's the limit, Justin, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> This is one of the things I, I like to ask people too. Like, what's sort of a day in the life of a person in your role? I don't think I have like a regular day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and every day brings something new. So, I mean, it's obviously, I can't escape the meetings. I haven't figured that part out yet. So if everybody in the audience knows, hit me up. But every day, it's, it's really about some new stuff. You do projects with the UN, some new ideas. Just yesterday, I was, I was talking to a guy I hadn't spoken to him since the start of the pandemic. And he used this downtime to create an AI tutor for underserved school children. So I was like, that, that's amazing. And he created like, you know, a nice little avatar and that kind of stuff. And now he just wants to roll it out to school. So he's looking for what's the best way to do that and how to hook into some of the UN initiatives. So a lot of his, part of his like helping people f kind of refine their ideas Part of it is just a lot of the execution and adoption, the, the, the tough work we got to do, but it's never the same day twice. That's, that's actually what I love about what I do. It's, it's always a new set of challenges and a new set of hopes. Yeah, that's awesome. I think I saw that you are sort of part of a, for lack of a better term, I guess, like an angel advisor group. Is that right? Yeah, I've been very active in advising investors and angels as well as participating in some of these funds. The honest truth is, Justin, the best innovative ideas come from the entrepreneurs and the startup companies. I think we just create a corporate culture now where the big companies, one, they don't want to rock the boat and they don't want to make the big investment of their own money and time. And they're more than happy now because they all have venture arms 
to place a small bet. They'd rather give this, you know, aspiring set of entrepreneurs a couple of million dollars and some other type, some equipment and help. They had put 50 million of their own time in and thousands of hours of their own people's time in to see if they can do something. And so I want to help fuel that because I think that's going to become the main source of innovation as we actually move forward. And if you think about drug discovery, the big pharma companies are all moving away from drug develop or drug, drug discovery and molecule development. They're putting that in the hands of the smaller companies. And if they can come up with something, they're more than happy to help with manufacturing, sales, and distribution, and taking a pretty large revenue share out of that, which means then it's really on us to all be innovators to figure out, well, what's the next big thing we can do? That's fabulous. Yeah, that's good. That's good. How do people reach out to you, Neil, I guess? If they, where are you best found on LinkedIn, Twitter? Yeah, I'm very active on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. So if you're wondering what I'm up to or some of the new trends are, please do uh, follow me. I post a lot of information on my website, which is just my name, neilsohoda.com. So if you want to just check out what's going on or if you have an idea or you're, you're looking to help like the UN for the AI for good, just drop me a message and I'm happy to help any way I can. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, I, I wonder if I was somebody coming out of college today, just knowing what you know, how would you suggest, what are some courses, some books, I guess, some organizations, can they just reach out to the UN and say, I'm here to help? What would you suggest people do? Well, the UN never has enough volunteers. So if you want to help, they'll, they'll definitely try to make the best use of whatever you're willing to give in terms of your time. So I definitely encourage that. In terms of you're in college or you're, or you're getting ready to start your career, there's a few things out there that even if you're not a technologist or engineer, just learn some of the foundational capabilities of like AI and machine learning. You don't need to be a, a data scientist. You don't need to become an ML programmer. Just learn what the tools offer so that you have the ability to apply those capabilities in your work. The other thing I'll tell you is that you do have to think differently. Most companies today they want people that are critical and creative thinkers. I found this surprising when I saw the stats a couple of years ago, but most companies prefer to hire MFAs, Master of Fine Arts, over MBAs because they like that creative thinking. So flex, flex that brain muscle, take some classes that's kind of stimulate that cortex and develop those creative thinking skills. And then th the best thing I can tell you is don't be afraid to take risks. Risk is not a bad word. Right, Risk is just uncertainty. It could be positive risk, which creates benefits. It could be a negative risk, which has threats. But if you're not really ever failing, you're not taking enough risk. And if you're not really thinking about how you can do something differently, you're definitely not taking enough risk. And it's not lip service from all these companies, whether you're a big, big, big established global Fortune 500 company or a small entrepreneurial startup. Everybody wants people that are willing to be risk takers these days. So take advantage. I love it. That is perfect. That's perfect. Well, this is great. It's been a great, great conversation. Is there anything else that you maybe wanted to talk about, I guess, that I didn't bring up during our chat here? Oh, there's probably a lot of things we could, we could talk about, <laughs> Justin. It's, it's such a, a right field. But I'll just kind of maybe end with this thought for everybody, because I, I know Look, we all watch movies and TV. We all read the books, the magazines, and it's always human versus machine, right? And humans always win out in the end because there's something intrinsically special about us. Well, I don't think that's the right mindset. There are things that humans do better than machines and vice versa. But this is not human versus machine. This is human and machine. And as soon as we flip that script in our minds, this is where we actually start understanding the opportunities that we have with AI. And so if there's one thing you can do right now is kind of reteach yourself human and machine. Well said, well said. Yeah, as I've been on my journey with regards to interviewing just thought leaders like yourself and a bunch of really, really smart people in the space, people have been talking about augmentation, right? It's, it's really about using AI and the technology to augment your life and make things easier, basically get rid of all of the mundane stuff and the stuff that humans aren't good at that you actually don't want to do. Those are the things that are basically primed for AI. And I think that was kind of the crux of what you said there, I guess, is, is the and, you know, and so how can we use AI and technology to become an and and augment what we do instead of a complete replacement? 
I love it. I love it. That goes exactly along with what I've been hearing and learning and trying to put myself, my, my, my mindset and, and my frame of reference, I guess, into those same words. Well, thank you, Neil. I appreciate the time today. And again, like I say, we'll, we'll be putting all of this information, all your contact information online, links to the book, links to your website and all of the notes. And I uh, would love to have you back on in the future. You know, we can talk about how things have changed in the coming years. Maybe, uh, you know, we'll, we can reconnect next year and, and see, see how things go. But it's a fascinating field and it's been really, really great having you on the show. So I appreciate your time today. Oh, it was my pleasure. And I would love to come back. I think we'll, a year from now, Justin, we'll have a whole new set of things to talk about. Absolutely. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.